Welcome everyone to tonight's meeting of the Spack and Kill Union Free School District Board of Education meeting, Tuesday, March 29th, third of our or second second of our three consecutive weekly board meetings. It's starting to become a habit here, <laughs> but help, happy to have everyone here with us tonight. And we'd like to call the meeting to order and ask everyone to stand for the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome uh, tonight at this evening's meeting a couple members, uh, was it three? 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 Three members of, uh, is it Mr. Arts class again? Yeah, Mr. Arts economics class? Yeah. Correct? Yes. So some of your classmates were here the last couple of meetings, so happy to have you here. And I hope you uh, um, enjoy the meeting and maybe learn a little about how, how these meetings run. Maybe you've been at them before, but uh, in any case, happy to have, have you here. So with that, we'll uh, turn to the consent agenda. This is the section of the agenda for, for again, for your students visiting. The section of the agenda that uh, involves a host of issues uh, on your agenda, if you've got in front of you, that uh, runs from section five through section uh, eight. And these are matters of kind of regular order that we review kind of as a block or as a group. So we'll ask if there are any comments uh, to the board on any of the consent agenda items. Don't believe we've received any questions or comments specifically about the consent agenda by email from the public. So any questions or comments about consent agenda items from, from the board? I just had a general question about item 8.01 uh, about the repair reserve fund. Um, and my comment is it seems like a really excellent idea so we don't get the district is prepared for you know expenses that you kind of know are going to be coming anyway um, and I just was curious of if we've had such a fund in the past um, if this you know if, or, if, or if this is kind of like an innovative approach to trying to help districts stay proactive and, and keep on top of kind of the repairs that we know are happening um, I'll start and then Val will jump in. Uh, I liked how, how she turned it, Val, <laughs> into innovative approach. Um, you know, it is, it's, it's a way to kind of protect for the future and that's what, you know, uh, you know, we thought about, you know, Val thought about it and she came to me and we talked about it and it just seemed to, to make sense to have that this year. Um, Val? Um, it's new to the district. It is a fund, it's a reserve that has been established by the state where districts have the opportunity to establish the fund and with the $24 million capital project, um, I just thought that this was a good time to start that fund for our district. So I guess just to follow up on that, do we have a fund that we use for a mini cap project every year as well? That is included in the budget. There's an appropriation of $100,000 which is the state limit that we have in every year's budget for Medicap projects. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I'll just add that I'm, I too am happy to see this. It's something we have talked about, I know, in the past, going back a number of years, in the event of, you know, whatever kind of emergency maintenance issue might arise, you know, a roof, uh, some other building problem. Um, now that we have the the field established, there's, you know, we can expect regular maintenance costs to be associated with that or replacement costs, you know, for por portions of that field. So we had talked in the past, I know, as a board about the desirability of having, you know, monies available. And it's, it's my understanding, I think I got confirmation on this earlier, that, you know, this reserve fund, this repair reserve fund could be funded in any number of ways, you know, going forward. So we have the option of, of building that fund up through, um, you know, Talked again. We talked in the past about things like rental fees for the field, that kind of thing. So it's it's good to hear that we could build this fund up through sources like that, you know, and others. Um, it makes a lot of sense, I think, as a, um, a 
fiscal uh, for fiscal foresight, I guess, to me. Any other questions or comments regarding consent agenda items? I might also just add real quickly on a kind of personal note. I, um, Joanne Schaffer, whose uh, resignation is being tendered as a consent agenda item here, is, uh, I know her personally and think a lot of her, so uh, I want to just commend and, and acknowledge her many years of service to the district. And she's been a real asset as a school social worker. Um, and again, I know her personally, so uh, great to see her service being uh, acknowledged and wish her well in retirement. Okay, so with that, I guess we'd ask for a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. So moved. Uh, second? I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, five zero. All right, so we'll move over to the discussion presentation section of the uh, agenda, section three. Here's Dr. Fenuelli. All right, before we begin, uh, you just mentioned how Joanne Schaffer is retiring, and it was, it was great that you uh, uh, acknowledged her. She has been really a rock here uh, in our district. I know uh, Dr. Mulford. Yeah. Go ahead. I know you're probably <laughs> no, going to say something. Just, she's an amazing, outstanding social worker. Um, she's so dedicated to our families, our students, and staff. Um, she is, she's going to be missed tremendously and really hard shoes to fill. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we wish her the best, and uh, we've also told her that you know we know where she is, and we're gonna <laughs> call on her if needed. Sure. All right, so uh, let's head into the presentation section. Um, so this is our uh, presentation. So let's get right at it. Next. So there's a two-page agenda. Just this is this. I don't want to necessarily read this to everyone, but this is what we're going to discuss. Uh, here tonight. This is what, what's on the PowerPoint. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the state budget and the economy and then uh, so, some of the things we have um, are looking at, you know, what are responsible decisions. And uh, we're going to talk a little about some district successes. And then we're going to get into uh, some budget implications, talk a little bit more about the uh, repair reserve, but we kind of talked about that a little bit now. And then uh, next slide. And then get right into the budget, the overview, tax levy, and then get down to some information about when the budget is. Um, so we'll go from there. All right, so our state budget. So we have conservatively budgeted our state revenue forecast in this budget. Our reserves are still healthy, and that's a plus. And the comptroller's fiscal stress report is positive. And this has been, been similar uh, for the past bunch of years. But we just want to point that out again. That's what we're doing. Uh, last year, that we talked a little bit about, you know, with COVID, a little bit about the district's instructional response. So we're going to continue that this year. Uh, a lot of the bullets on here are things we did last year, but there's things that we want to point out that we're, we're looking to do again. So we're going to analyze the gaps in learning. Um, our teachers' observations have really been uh, instrumental in that. Uh, offer academic support for the most at-risk students. Um, this current year, um, when there was quarantine periods, we, we had daily after-school instruction for kids on quarantine. So if, if this could, that continues next year, we all hope uh, we're not in that state, uh, but if that, that happens, we uh, would like to continue that. Uh, the Summer Academy last year, we thought was it was a success, and we're looking to run that again this year. Uh, Three-week program with the focus, you know, especially in the areas of reading, writing, and math. So those, those are going to stay at least for one more year. I knew this is kind of our response, but we felt that we, we still needed that here. We're going to focus our summer curriculum writing and professional development on uh, items that we see through uh, our anal an analyzing of the gaps. And last year, uh, specifically, and we're going to run it again this year, is we had what's called a virtual tech academy. And it's been the past couple years, and it's really been vital to the district because uh, the number of teachers that took courses 
uh, to, to learn different ways of teaching continues, you know, even though we, hybrid doesn't exist, you know, knock on wood, no more in person, uh, many teachers learn skills that they continue to use in the classroom today. So we are looking to offer that again this summer. Um, also something we talked about last year, but again this year, is the AVID program is uh, going to be starting at the middle school next year. And the high school will be planning uh, to offer it in two years. It's going to start in grade seven, so it goes seven, eight, and then nine and works up. So be aware of that. And the Positivity Project, we've talked about before. I think we've had some presentations and some quotes from, from uh, some of our students uh, from our elementary principals. But the Positivity Project is something that we're very proud of. Uh, it's currently at the elementary school and Todd. Todd is running it again on the fourth quarter. Um, and that's been, been a huge success. So we're gonna look to continue those. So what are responsible decisions? This is sort of what we, uh, Ms. Murphy and I used to, to kind of help develop this presentation. So we want to present a budget that is under the tax cap. Uh, we want to provide a budget that reduces the possibility of significant negative fluctuations in the future. All right, that means you don't want something that's so low that next year has to be super high or something that's super high then you, you know you, you want to try to ha maintain a steady uh, tax levy for for tax so it's, it's not a roller coaster and that's that's sort of our hope maintaining a student-centered learning environment communicating the academic successes of the district right we're going to be doing that here today and promoting the economic vitality of the district and seeking additional revenues throughout a district tuition program that continues that 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 is actually uh, going very strong um, and we'll look at that in a moment so some of our successes um, this is nice uh, so niche ranks spack and kill is the number one school district in dutchess county um, spack and kill also places in the top three percent of over ten thousand ranked district across america so you can check this out on niche it's nice um, there's different quotes on there um, Spack and Kill is one of the best places to live in Dutchess County. So we, we don't actually need this ranking. We already know that, for, you know, from people who are in our community. Um, but uh, it, it's one of the best places he, here in Dutchess County. We're proud of that. So it's nice having that as kind of a, you know, a, a little feather in our cap. Uh, next. So some of the other items that we, we some of these we've seen before because they're repeats, which is nice. So the Utica National Safety Award, um, the district is a 10-year winner of that, which which is nice. Since 2012, um, we are considered one of the best communities for music education. Uh, U.S. News uh, has placed uh, Spack and Kill High School in the in the top six percent among their 18,000 high schools, 2021. Um, Definitely, uh, we've had that before, but, but still proud of that. And the Scholastic Arts Awards, you know, 26 uh, high school ranked gold or silver and 14 received honorable mention. So that's, that's nice for us. And then uh, some of our sports accolades. I, this, this one right here is, is, we're not aware of it, we'd like everyone to be. So, so far this year, you know, through the fall and winter season, 100% of our varsity athletic teams have earned scholar athlete. That's something to be proud of. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, we do know our varsity football team won its first Section 9 championship, which was cool. I think a lot of us were out there in the cold weather um, you know, with our knit caps on. Um, the varsity girls uh, won the Mid-Hudson uh, Athletic League this winter, just not that long ago. And the boys varsity basketball team won the Sportsmanship Award, which was nice. Um, you know, those, those top two, you know, the scholar athlete, sportsmanship, that's something to be proud of. Uh, not just winning a championship, but just how we act. Um, in 19, excuse me, in 2021, despite the pandemic, we had over 100 students take uh, over 200 AP exams. And this is something to be proud of. This was in a newsletter not that long ago. Uh, the high school has earned College Board's AP Computer Science Female Diversity Award 
for expanding young women's access to the AP computer science pr principles. That's kind of that's kind of cool when you're talking about trying to promote, um, you know, and, and to, you know to diverse audiences and especially female. Um, back in the high school was only one of 300, 760 schools in the nation to be recognized with this honor. Speck and Kill Real Estate, if you happen to check out the demand for houses, demand for houses uh, continues going up, uh, trending up 6.5% year over year, uh, which is pretty impressive. It's just, just there's no homes, uh, if their home goes for sale, it sells right away in Spack and Kill. It's considered a seller's market. Uh, it's a good time to sell. I don't know if it's a great time to buy, but it's a good time to sell. Um, the, the, what is it? the demand for homes in Spack and Kill continues to be very high and inventory is low. So people want to live here. Um, as far as tuition students, just to give a little report on that, that has still gone very well. Um, I Pretty much most of our current students have signed on we've been uh, for for next uh, school year so currently we're at 32 students um, and tuition uh, next year will be uh, 12,900 yeah, there's an extra zero as an extra comma there it should be a decimal point <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have to worry about the budget uh, <laughs> if that was accurate um, moving into the budget part of this and we're going to it's going to slide over to Val in one moment, but these are some of the main pieces uh, that might be new to the budget or, or something that has an implication that didn't have before. And with that, I'll slide it over to Val. Thank you, Dr. Fabiwelli. Um, the A budget is the spending plan that will estimate the expenses you know, for next year's district's operations. So in addition to the usual recurring expenses, this budget includes funding to replace two school buses, to replace um, a vehicle for the facilities department, to fund two OTPT positions. Currently, those are contracted out, so we're looking to bring those positions um, as employees in the district. And we're also looking to developing a pilot program for um, PK students, pre-K students. <coughs> The repair reserve. Earlier tonight, the board um, approved a resolution to establish the repair reserve. These funds will be used to cover non-recurring um, costs to repair capital improvements or capital equipment. For example, the new turf field, the roofs that we've just put on um, all of our buildings, and the track. This reserve will be funded over the course of years um, from appropriated fund balance whenever there's appropriated fund, unappropriated fund balance available at the end of a school year. The maximum balance in this reserve um, will be limited to $750,000. It will build up to that over time and we can spend from it as the need arises. Any non-emergency expenditure from that repair reserve must require a public hearing and board of approval before those funds can be expended to, to make any repairs. Um, this is a slide that has been in a few other presentations prior this year and basically summarizes our revenue projections for this budget. The numbers have been updated based on additional information that we have received um, since the last presentation. The state aid number is still a little over $13 million. That number is not final until the state passes their state budget. So that number could be subject to change. Um, right now, we're projecting to use $350,000 in fund balance. We're anticipating an estimated revenue from local sources of $490,884, estimating pilot payments of $4.5 million. And our proposed tax levy to support this budget is $32,002,692. In previous board meetings, we've had questions um, regarding the impact that the federal stimulus funds could have on the general fund budget. Um, I'm not going to read the slide, but basically the federal government has very specific criteria for the use of these funds. 
and have suggested that or required that these non-recurring revenues be recorded as federal funds and not as a revenue source for our general fund, which is the budget. The state controller also recommends that these one-time revenues be used to finance non-recurring expenditures. And this non-recurring revenue stream should not be factored into this year's or this year or any other year's ensuing budgets. This will allow for us to have a structurally balanced budget. There are two categories of the federal stimulus funds, the, the CURSA funds, which basically address the overall impact that COVID-19 has had on our schools, and the ARP funds are designed to provide additional instructional support for our students. Just hold there for a second, go back one. So just, this is something that's come up here, so we just wanted to be clear. So those funds don't really go into changing your budget because they're, they're considered one time. So, so in this, we had COVID, so we had expenses that we had to deal with that. We paid for that, but then hopefully COVID goes away. I don't know, do we knock on wood on that? Um, and then you don't have those funds anymore for that. So it's really, it, it doesn't do anything to change your uh, budget. It doesn't, doesn't lower your budget because we had these funds. It doesn't raise your budget. Um, so I just want to be clear on that because I don't know if we've been perfectly clear on that in the past. So that's why that slide is in there. Um, based on our budget, there are six categories of the budget that comprise the lion's share of the budget. Um, salaries, insurance, OC's expenses, the retirement systems, and debt service. Combined, those categories represent 85% of our budget. And a lot of those categories are, we have very little flexibility in a lot of those ca categories. Um, salaries are based on contracted agreements. Um, health insurance and BOCES are expenses that are dictated to the district. The state dictates the percentages that we are required to contribute for the retirement systems, and our debt service payments are based upon um, the bonds that were issued to pay for capital projects. And this is an overview of the proposed 22-23 budget. Right now we're proposing a 22-23 budget of 50 million $411,139. Uh, last year's budget was $48,946,037. So our proposed budget represents an increase of $1,465,102, or a 2.99% increase over the current year's budget. To support this budget, we're estimating a tax levy increase of 1.66%, and that increase puts us $928,033 under the maximum, maximum allowable tax levy that the district can impose. To go into a little more detail about the tax levy, um, the levy to support the current year's budget is $31,481,22. Based on the tax cap calculation for the 22-23 school year, the district could impose a levy up to $32,930,725. The maximum increase in the levy would be a 4.6% increase over the current levy. To support the $50 million budget, we are proposing a tax levy of $32,2,692 which is an increase of $522,570 over the current year's levy, or a 1.66% increase. And that increase is the lowest tax levy increase that the district has imposed in the last four years. <coughs> the district is required to present our proposed budget in what's called a three-part budget the three parts being administrative expenses, program expenses, and capital expenses. Administrative expenses are basically the board expenses and district office and centralized expenses. That represents approximately 10% of our overall budget. The lion's share of the budget, as it should be, is in programs, which is all of our instructional expenses, 
um, BOCES, special education, transportation costs, those costs represent approximately 74% of our budget. The last category is capital expenses. Those are our custodial, custodial expenses, the debt service for our capital project bonds, um, bus purchases, utilities, and that is approximately 16% of our budget. And year to year, those percentages have been pretty consistent amongst the three categories. Okay, I will turn this back over to Dr. Fanuelli so to is, present this is what his we budget. Just, just talked about. So uh, there is the uh, superintendent budget and uh, the, the the estimated tax levy in that third bullet, with you know just under a million dollars under the tax cap. Budget vote, when? Uh, May 17th, right? Time seems to be flying. So uh, we're, we're entering April by the end of this week, right? Today's the 29th, so uh, you're talking a little over a, a month and a half away. Um, it'll be in person. It'll be at the high school um, in the auditorium or the auditorium lobby. And uh, we'll be voting on the budget. And there also will be voting for one five-year term for a board of education trustee. There is a link that works. We checked it. It didn't work uh, uh, originally, but uh, we got word of that, and uh, we checked it out, so that works. And so that is listed on this uh, presentation, but you could also just get it from the website, too, if you just go to our website. And I think that's the last slide. So I guess the normal question is, are there any questions? with the, um, the slide that talked about the occupational therapist and physical therapist, I think, moving from a contract to hiring. I, um, I guess I'm interested in there's the benefits of that, um, why we would choose to do that, go away from contracts, and then to consider like the budget implications of that. So you've, uh, you've asked a question that is a passion. <laughs> Dr. I'd Mulford. love to answer. Uh, she, I'm surprised she even let me speak. Uh, this is something we've spoken about for a while, like maybe yeah. even since last year. Um, so why don't you go? Back sure. Over. Well, at, uh, we, when we were audited last year, one of the concerns was that um, we weren't going out to bid each year for a new occupational therapist. And obviously, we know that's not in the best interest of students to have them continually changing uh, OTs and PTs. So first and foremost, we kind of have to um, because that practice isn't even really um, sound for children anyway. And the other thing is, is that when we have committed OT and PT employees, they want to be part of the SPAC and Co community. When they're a contractor, they're often not in involved in faculty meetings, professional development, there's no sick time, vacation time, things like that. So they're really missing out on all of the, you know, the aspects of being a part of the community. So this would bring them into the community. And in terms of, of cost, um, we're looking at comparable to what they're making now as contractors. I think there's very little um, cost increase with, with moving in this direction. So, so even like paying the typical things like that you would pay for, um, I know, retirement schedules and things like that, that that's still covered in the, you know, by having people uh, that you're employing directly. Right, so, so we looked at what they would make annually as a contractor and say reduce their salary that they would start out to account for things like the retirement system and benefits, and things like that. So they're, what they'll bring home will be less. Would this involve a, a recruitment effort to, to find candidates, or are there people in, in the um, district now who, who would be candidates for this? 
We, we, uh, one of our OTs just left the district because she was between three different employers. So she landed a position in one, one place, which, you know, I, I can understand that. Um, and I did post it to OLAS and I did get a handful of applicants. Um, but we've decided to continue with the um, contractor model for the remainder of this year. So I'm optimistic that we had five applicants for this year, and we have an OT working in the district who's very happy to be here. So we would go through the interview process and post and all of that, but um, we have somebody who's doing a very fine job in the district now. Okay, so. The way I see it, it looks like we're anticipating about 20% increase in state aid. Um, what concerns me with that is that we're increasing the budget by 3%. So although our levy is low, relatively low, I don't want to get us into a position where that three extra percent is something that's permanent that we have to carry through and then all of a sudden state aid starts cutting back down to what it was before. I'm assuming that some of that state aid is coming because of ARPA money or whatever else that the state may have extra from the feds right now. So um, can, can we just talk about the 3%? Is that a lot of uh, permanent type of programs or is that just some extra usage for this year that we can cut back on without having attrition or anything else like that in the future? We would, I don't want to say that we were expecting that question, but uh, we, we, we figured that would come. So I know Val uh, is ready for this. Um, one of the things in the slide where we talked about the additional things in the budget, the purchase of two buses, the purchase of a facilities vehicle, those are the kinds of things that are one-time expenses. Um, we're using the budget to pay for the buses instead of the bus reserve that we have specifically for that purpose because we have the extra state aid. So we're just making use of that extra state aid to make these one-time purchases. So we're not <coughs> funding it with routine purchases. Okay. And then we'd have the ability to use the fund for buses in the future because we didn't use it right. this from, year. From the reserve. From the reserve, not from the budget, if we deem that to be the, the right way. Okay. Which it usually is. So good question. I'm glad you asked it because then we could actually address it. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm always I'm always trying to get that concept of the, the sustainability of everything yeah. moving forward. And so, I know I've talked about that five-year plan. I'd still like to get information on that sooner than later, so we can continue to make the right decisions here. questions that concludes our presentation and we will be having uh, hearings on the budget you know coming up in subsequent meetings correct well next next board meeting the board would, would adopt the budget correct right. Which is next week, and then hearing subsequent, <laughs> hearing subsequent to that. Yes, yes, yes. Opportunities for the public. Right? Mm -hmm. Our plan, I think, is to have two hearings, right, as we did last year. Is that, is that still the case? Right now, we have May third. Is a is a hearing? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's two. No. One. We did. Yeah. Yeah. We did two. Yeah. We did two last week because of COVID. Yes, right. Okay. So one. All right, so with that, uh, let's see my presentation for tonight, correct? Yes. So we we'll move to the communication section, section four of our agenda, and ask if there are any comments from the public at tonight's meeting. We thought I wasn't going to come up here. I guess it may have kind of been answer, asked, Mr. Kohler asked it, so I guess I have a couple questions first. So, the turf, the tractor roof, that set of expenses, right? All those are new, right, as of right now. 
and so if there's a unappropriated funds that come in this year, we're just going to automatically push that until we build that balance to seven hundred fifty thousand. Like I don't think we should have any of those expenses in the near future. I don't think, and I hope. I mean, at least I hope not. So I guess that's just a question. There is, you know, are we looking to fund that budget for those repairs right away, knowing that there's really, hopefully, there's none of those repairs since they're all new for at least the three items that you listed in that in that category. Um, for, as for the stimulus funds, you kind of said that they're a separate budget item, and Mr. Kohler, you kind of asked that same question, right? So. Let's just, for example, hypothetical, right? Due to COVID, we had too many kids on a bus. We needed an extra bus for to keep social distancing on the buses. Could that expense be submitted for the, you know, out of those stimulus funds? And it may be a bus we need already, so we kind of get that paid for for free. So when you say it's a different budget and it's not included, I get that, but it's still money that may or may not be needed for things that we needed before COVID that may fall into a category that we can now expense through those extra funds, right? I'm sure there's a bunch of those, like air conditioning and heating, right? You could have upgraded those systems under the, you know, the, the reason for COVID, COVID issues and get it paid for out of that budget. So I guess I'm not clear when you say it's a completely different budget and we can't include it. There, I, I think there are certain expenses that the district would have incurred regardless that can be now be submitted and, and reimbursed out of those funds, which would offset either money in a previous budget that was approved and sitting in some fund that we didn't no longer need to use. Kind of like what you said, we're going to push this expense off and use this you know, for another reason. So. I'm still unclear as to where all that money is going and do we have have that kind of itemized as to of those of that money that we have to spend how much of that stimulus money is being used for those items that, that still hasn't become clear to me I'm going to uh, try to answer those questions, um, and if we don't have all the information, we can come back again. Uh, the repair re reserve uh, fund, um, you know, some of those items might not happen, you know, with the, the, the turf field being new, but also it's also things like roofs. If there's a leak in the roof, if if something uh, we find the, the the windows break or so something happens, you know, it's it's not just for uh, the turf fields. We just thought that was a, a good example of things because um, you start to see in the news how turf fields need repairs done to them and, and, and they might not have money appropriated to it. Um, and we're not looking to fund this this year. We're not looking to put 700. <laughs> That's just the, you know, the maximum over the years. So it's just starting the fund. So, um, but anything could happen uh, that we could use that for. I don't know if you have any other examples or do you think I no, I mean, that? those are the types of things. Anything that was part of a capital expense. So, I mean, we had 20, you know, the $24 million project, which was, you know, HVAC and the roofs and the fields and all of that other stuff. So anything related to a capital improvement can be, that reserve fund can be used for. And it will be funded over time, like it says, um, as funds are available from unappropriated fund balance, that amount may differ from year to year. And that we're just saying that the maximum balance that that fund could have at any point in time will be the 750000 Go forward. So is it appropriate to think of that as a maintenance fund? It is, a, it is for non-recurring maintenance, right. so it's not something... One-time maintenance. One-time maintenance, unexpected emergencies. Heating, That's what that boiler, goes, boiler goes, something like yes. that. Right. Yes, which could happen with our boilers, yeah, a couple of, um, so it's, we're just trying to be prepared for the future. Uh, as far as the second question, um, you know, it, it just is a separate fund. I, I don't know how else to say it other than, you know, this is why we put this slide together to try to make it clear that um, it's just for things that we would buy that we needed to do in order to deal with COVID 
and then the belief is you won't need to do that again. Now, if we did say buy air conditioners uh, because we wanted to have more, you know, airflow, it's not like we would. It's still because of COVID, so maybe we, we could have used our money, but we didn't budget our money to buy air conditioners. We, we, we used, you know, just to kind of give an example, and then we do get to keep them, so that's the benefit of using the, the money, but we wouldn't have, we didn't budget for them originally when we bought it, so that's why when you use that money, it then kind of goes away. So, you know, I, I don't know how else to answer that question, and, and as far as what the money is used for, I think we answered that last bu uh, bu uh, board meeting, I was going to say budget meeting, where we haven't even submitted reimbursement yet. Um, we have until 2024 to do that, um, but we do have on the website the type of things that we're looking, uh, and they were COVID-related. I don't know if you want to throw some out there. You know, you buy masks, you buy... And, the, the, right, and, and instructional related for you know after school programs, um, you know, like Dr. The tutoring, right? Yeah, Dr. 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 Fanny Wells, yeah. a lot of the mask and the extra cleaning supplies, and um, we bought extra, or the budget has for extra desks because of social distancing for the kids when they couldn't eat in the cafeteria. Those kinds of those are the things that were included in the budget that we submitted to the federal government. So that's what we would seek reimbursement for, which which we have not done yet. And it's it's not you don't seek reimbursement for it as you spend it. You usually do it in chunks. That's how the state likes it because you know then they they deal with it and they don't they're not they don't want to look at it every week. Hey, we bought this. They want to see it. So that's something we would probably do, um, you know, after the budget season. My understanding is that if, um, <coughs> you know, there were, as you said, about you know, capital expenses, you know, HVAC is an example, I think that's on a lot of people's minds because there was a lot of talk during COVID about the desirability of improving HVAC systems, you know, to mitigate the effects of, of COVID. Um, in our case, uh, you know, we've had a lot of HVAC improvements that were part of the capital project. So there would have been a redundancy, you know, or no need. I guess a more accurate way of looking at it. No need to improve the HVA system since they've been improved already, right? So uh, I can sort of understand. I certainly do understand where that question is coming from. I mean, in, in part, it seems to me it's an accounting kind of issue. Could we get, you know, some expenses covered by accounting for them, you know, in a different way? But I think, you know, what what you're saying, Paul, is that we're looking at the the needs of the district and, and our budgeting process uh, and making sure everything lines up. You know, in terms of the relationship between our budget operating expenses, you know, say versus capital improvement project, which we're getting right on the heels of, still living, um, still it's still ongoing. Actually, phase five is still you know, yet to happen. Yeah, I, I believe there's actually a number of, of classrooms because I've actually this was one of the things I was pushing for. Also, was I, I did want to see if there were any rooms, you know, that we had taken a look at any of those that could use additional, whether it's a split unit, if you can get the filtration from it as well, because then we're using this one-time money for something that's gonna serve us better long-term. I mean, you know, window AC units are certainly not very efficient, and we can do better in terms of our energy uses long-term long, long -term by improving that as well. So the, the other thing is, is uh, you know, since the track and all that, I've always been a big fan of this because I've seen this in municipalities and everything else. Deferred maintenance fund is what I like to call it, really, uh, and that, that's what I—that's what I like in this this uh, fund too. And it's very important because it's a way to not have to go out to bid for something when we know it's going to be there. So, for for example, with the field, we knew that about 10 years from now, there's going to have to be some crumb rubber replacement. Probably they're going to have to pull it out. They got pull the, the grass up and then put the infill back in. So we, I've been talking about that with, with regard to also, you know, the rentals of the fields and all that. I thought that that was always something that should go into a fund that we could use later for that. So I, I'm happy to see that we're going through with that. Just a comment on the, the air conditioning. In order to do like the, you know, HVAC that's, you know, up to the ceiling, it, 
we don't want, we didn't have close to money from from uh, these COVID funds for that. You know that, that's just a different level. Um, we were able to do some some minor things with some window units and and some things like that. So uh, we were happy for that. But like the big systems is, is, is more of a capital project. Is the the, the funds just I mean, we got money and we're happy for it, but it's not money like to cover things like that. Yeah, I was kind of talking more about like split units, which are yeah. relatively reasonable, but I don't know if you get that filtration that yeah. we see normally through a split unit as opposed to, you know, the, the big HVACs in the ceiling with the, what was it, MRF 13 ratings or whatever yeah. else. But some of that was replaced during the capital project, some of the ceiling HVA systems. Todd in this building, no, that we're in for sure. And then there were quite a few portable units, filter, uh, air filter units, right, that are being utilized, have been utilized throughout the last two years. Yeah. You know, yes, uh, we bought them and we would use, that would be a perfect uh, uh, use of that money that we seek reimbursement on. Yeah. When we uh, seek the uh, reimbursement from the COVID money um, and we receive that money back, um, where does the uh, when we receive it, does it go back into specific areas that we use to, you know, uh, purchase these uh, air conditioners or whatever it is that we're seeking reimbursement from, or where does that money end up going to, or where do we uh, attribute that back to, I guess? Well, we would uh, originally refund it to the area that had the expenditure. So if we bought equipment, it would go back into an equipment code. If we bought, like, the mask and the cleaning supplies, all of those things would go back into supply codes. Okay. In, the, in the respect of building, you know, that incurred expenses. So knowing we are going to get a reimbursement, you know, we paid for the stuff last year, we're going to get reimbursed for it next year. Is that um, being considered when we're um, budgeting towards those supply items next year, that we yes. may have a surplus of it, that we may have more funds coming towards those? What we did for supplies is we basically utilize the normal level of supply spending, where it's COVID inflated all of that, we're now back down to budgeting where we normally would from year to year. Okay. So I, I think that the, the questions we're all kind of asking is, is are we maximally using the, the these CRSSA funds and the AIRP to to their most their their best benefit for our budget. Um, do you see any ways to improve that, or do we feel that we're taking full advantage of that um, for our taxpayers and for our budget? Well, based on the criteria that we are that we that has been imposed on us on how to spend these funds. Um, definitely working with all the building administrators and Dr. Fanuelli, we have come up with what we feel is the best way to equitably and fairly allocate those funds across the district, especially the instructional funds are very specific. It has to be for a summer program, it has to be for an after school program, it has to do to address learning loss. Those we have very little leeway in how to apply those funds. Um, the cursive funds, we have a little bit more leeway, which is why we're using those funds to do the cleaning supplies and the mask and, you know, the air filtration systems and those kinds of things. So we, we, where we have flexibility, we're definitely trying to maximize those dollars. Do you anticipate us being able to use all of the uh, funds before 2024? I definitely anticipate us using all those funds, yes. Okay. Is that the, is that the, are we going to spend all this money? Yeah, I <laughs> mean, they, they're giving it to us, so we'll, we'll find, yeah. um, find, find a way to spend yeah. the money. And, and the we don't know what's going to happen next year, right. you know, right. so uh, that's also piece two, is being a little cautious <laughs> of what, what we might need next year. Um, just again, knock on wood, you know, it, you know, we're just, we're kind of in that zone of let, let's have a year where we, we don't need COVID funds and then, you know, we'll see, you know, with the, where the dust settles, but we, we could be spending this on, on things that we don't know we need yet. Of course, this 
your state budget isn't finalized yet. That's not until right. June, right? Um, well, it's due April 1st, but... Yeah. Well, by the rain, <laughs> the rain, and the rain, like, it usually takes a while. Although it's a new administration, so I guess it's... And both we'll houses have sure. their, their, their sins, so... Yeah. Any other comments from the public? We didn't get anything from We don't have uh, any correspondence no, that relates no, no, no to emails. Uh, in the form of questions, uh, certainly. Yeah. Any other comments from the board? I have one. I have a little bit of regret from last week because we didn't challenge the seniors to anything last week, so <laughs> I, I expect Dr. Fanwelly to pose some sort of a question to our seniors to see what they've learned here. <laughs> All right, here. seniors. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just so that the superintendent did not ask this, the board member asked this. Is anyone willing to say one thing you've learned here tonight? <laughs> Who's going to step up to the plate? <laughs> so it's 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 interesting you said that um, we are actually considered well, a, a smaller district. If you happen to go to a, a, a bigger district, you would really be overwhelmed with the amount of money their their budgets are. Um, but that's that's a, a good question. Yes, and it's 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 good that you noticed that, right? Because you you never really thought of that when you thought of. You know, going to school and what happens in the process. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're here to do that. And I'm sure Ms. Gerard will follow up <laughs> these board meetings with a lesson in class. Right. You want more from them, uh, Mr. Kohler? <laughs> 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 a lot of money. That's a, that's a good observation. She's absolutely right. <laughs> okay. Any comments? Over to you, Dr. Fenway. Any further comments? Final comments? Uh, no, just uh, stay tuned for, for next week. We, we have a, a, our third of three in a row, which, which actually I thought kind of worked out well, just having a, a meeting for the budget tonight where we could just focus on that. Um, you know, so next week, any other questions, you know, c come back with that so we can uh, answer them. I'm, I'm very... Uh, very proud of this budget. I think I think it works for everyone. It keeps uh, SPAC and Kill uh, continuing the, the path as it's on, um, but also I think it's you know aware of not trying to make the tax levy uh, too high and to have it one of the lowest you know one of the lowest in four years was something that um, I know Val and I were happy with. So um, with that, and also want to thank uh, the students for coming and Miss Gerard uh, for coming three. She has come three straight meetings. Um, and I believe she came to another meeting uh, with the student government <laughs> report, so uh, we'll have to have a special seat for her. Uh, but with that, we'll see everyone next week. Okay. Yeah, I would certainly second all those things. I mean, I, I notably, I think I'm particularly impressed to, to see that, you know, the budget coming in, you know, almost a million dollars under what it could be, you know, allowed under, under the, the tax cap. So I think that's quite... Uh, important to kind of keep in mind, uh, and again, the lowest in, in four years, the lowest tax, cap, uh, tax levy increase in four years, and almost a million dollars under what it could be. Uh, a lot of hard work went into that, uh, you know, and I want to thank really Val um, uh, for working on the budget and in conjunction with all the other uh, administrative officials and Dr. Fanny Weller and your leadership. I think it's, uh, yeah, we're not promising a million under uh, every year. No, but, uh, <laughs> but we should acknowledge it when, when it happens because that's significant. Very good. So with that, do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Okay, second. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much, everyone. We look to see you, uh, welcome you to our, our next meeting next week, next Tuesday. <laughs>